Great, well, kia ora koutou. Um, thank you so much, Tina, for organising this Bigger Picture series and for inviting us here today. And um, also thanks to um, Ezra and Amelia for um, joining me on the panel today and for the work that you do in the sector. So I'm Group Manager of Public Policy at um, Vector, where my role is to identify challenges and opportunities that emerge from our public policy settings and to then work towards a solution. So I'm Amelia Rizzi, I started with Shell, worked there for 12 years, uh, OMV as well, and then moved to Heading Energy. In terms of the energy trilemma, I think it's something that I'm sort of learning about as I go along. I have very much an industry bias, um, but also uh, possibly a bit of a socialist bias as well. Um, so it'd be interesting to yeah, see how that comes out in some of the discussions. Yeah, I know nothing about in the energy trilemma, but what I do know about is what it's like to be poor. Um, and I do know what it's like to um, be with those who don't have access to essential services like power. Uh, no my rā, though it is a kaupapa Māori power company, um, isn't just for Māori. I think it is our role as industry to be focusing on all three, right? I mean, when you think about the context of climate change, energy hardship, and our increasing reliance on electricity, it just can't be any other way. But I think that the real issue is that we see these outcomes as being in tension with one another, and so that is what we get. So for instance, after the August 9th grid emergency, some stakeholders were saying, well, if you put more cost into the system, someone is going to have to wear that cost. And whilst that's true, um, basically what that stakeholder was implying is that the only way to ensure reliability is by overbuilding or building to the peak, which is very expensive, hence this perceived trade-off between affordability and reliability. But I don't think it has to be that way at all. Solutions that can manage demand, that can strengthen coordination through the system, can support both affordability and reliability and they do this by increasing the utilisation of our existing infrastructure, reducing cost. Overbuilding, on the other hand, it does the opposite. It reduces utilisation and so it increases cost. Um, so, and I think that, you know, we can't just keep relying on the same approaches and solutions of the past and expect to magically adapt to the challenges of the future. We really need to be turning our attention towards digital solutions that can be driving the trilemma outcomes is mutually reinforcing rather than mutually exclusive. And I think the issue of the trilemma is because it posits these outcomes as trade-offs, it fails to recognise the value of these solutions. Yeah, I guess I'd take a slightly different take on it as well. I think if we look at it on a macro or a national level, um, our plan for an energy strategy does seem to um, address all three of the energy trilemma. Um, that obviously comes sort of well under the umbrella of reducing our emissions and our goal to net zero. So I think there is a little bit of a spin in terms of sustainability on it. But I also think as a country, the focus that we put on each, um, each of the three of the trilemma depends on what the issue of the day is. So it feels very reactive. But I think that we maybe need to take a much more macro focus because certainly, yeah, it feels very reactive at the moment. I think from, from a consumer perspective, um, it, in, in, in focusing weight on which one of the dilemmas of the trilemma we focus on, for the customer, but how do we educate them that these conversations are being had? You know, because for them, they just get a bill every month or every week and it just goes up. And so from their perspective, it's like no weight's going anywhere. You know, so the question that we're always challenging is, okay, if we're going to enter into these discussions, what's the journey we're going to take the customer on? How do we tell them that there's more to this than just what you're seeing in your letterbox or seeing online? There's a lot of great talk in all areas, but not a lot of action in any of them. I was going to say, I completely agree, Amelia, that we need to have that kind of macro system level view. And also, Ezra, I think your observation that there are a whole lot of silos in our system and in our sector is absolutely right. If Europe had uh, neglected security and um, affordability in the name of sustainability, they wouldn't have necessarily just been relying on Russian gas for their energy systems. I also think that in general, you can still have sustainability without neglecting affordability and security. The last couple of years in the UK, I think it was 2020, um, both the UK and Denmark 
increased quite significantly this year of wind power, um, so increased in the sustainability, but their affordability to the electricity prices remained somewhat consistent. I also think that the reason that affordability and security is an issue is because of geopolitics, um, obviously, the war in Ukraine, and also because of the pandemic and clear supply chain issues from everything, from raw material supply to resource supply. Yeah, I guess I also don't see the you know global situation with energy markets as being a reflection of decision makers prioritising one thing over the other, simply because I don't think any politician um, would have consciously chosen the energy prices that we're seeing in the UK. But I think that what we can take away from that experience is the risk of being overly exposed to and reliant on commodity markets, whether that be international or domestic, and not focused enough on system efficiency and resilience. And what I mean by that is in New Zealand's electricity market, we value the commodity too much and we value solutions to manage demand not enough. And we value the commodity the most when supply is getting low, so our generation market is the most profitable when we get close to having not enough, which by itself is, I don't think, a great incentive for security of supply. And I know that some people out there will be arguing with that because they'll be saying, no, high wholesale prices are the best incentive for security of supply because it will attract all this new investment, except in New Zealand we haven't consistently seen that. And I know that other people will be saying, well, that's just how markets work. You use price as a lever to manage demand. Except in New Zealand's electricity market, demand is largely inelastic. So until we get the solutions in place to enable demand to respond, that high wholesale price signal will go largely unanswered, but it will just inflate consumers' electricity bills. So basically, the system isn't stretchy enough to respond to new demand in a resilient way. And I think until we change that, um, our market isn't as efficient as it could be, and we potentially do leave ourselves exposed to future supply and price challenges. If that were to happen, I don't think it would have anything to do with global commodity markets. I think it would be an us thing. What can we learn from the EU? I think we as New Zealanders are a little bit... Complacent might be a strong word, but I think we're not necessarily aware of what the the biggest challenges are that are happening um, over in Europe at the moment. We certainly don't seem to be talking about it so much. But I also think we're in a position where we have um, our own natural resources. What we can learn from it is maybe security for supply around our fuels. So we import all our liquids um, and obviously Hedinger is working to locally produce then do a transition of liquid fuels to hydrogen. Um, so maybe that's the kind of thing that we should start talking about and learning from, from what the situation in Europe is. I can only speak through experiences of what we're trying at Nomida. Uh, we've, we've put a whole bunch of solar panels on different marae around the country and then using the excess solar to then minimise the cost of energy to the whanau that whakapapa to that marae. And we've just seen that do wonders to the, to the consumer but then also we're encouraging the, the use of building more renewable energy sources. And so it looks like it's saving the marae money, it's saving the whanau money and it's a cleaner way of doing it. Um, and yeah, we just kind of come up with it by looking at what other people are doing overseas, um, looking at the, the, the word, the, the sexy word that they were using, and I don't really know what it means, is decentralisation, but I think that that's worked well for us and what we're doing through just lived, lived experience, and, uh, yeah, just through experience, um, and we're continuing to try that. We might jump on the MTR stuff with Araki and all that kind of jazz, but I think um, instead of you know, getting away from one big machine that generates it, feeds the nation, having little networks, I've heard the words embedded network kind of floated around in, in our discussions that we're having, having, we've just seen from our perspective that those things have affected affordability and sustainability. I don't know how that works from a um, security perspective, but seems to be a bit at the moment. Just sort of picking up on your point about decentralisation, Ezra, I sort of see that as being part of a wider focus on the demand side of our energy system and enabling demand response technologies. So I think in particular there's a really exciting opportunity around smart EV charging, which is a form of demand response technology, and basically that can help keep power affordable for every electricity consumer, whether or not they own an EV, because that technology helps us avoid capital expenditure through the system. 
So for, for instance, some um, work that we've done with Frontier Economics has found that a single residential smart EV charger adds 274 New Zealand dollars per annum in the system by way of an avoided cost. So that is avoided, um, you know, displaced generation investments that would have needed to be made, distribution deferral, the impact on, you know, system balancing. So, um, yeah, I think we really need to be looking at some of our market and regulatory settings to make sure that they are aligned with the demand, you know, unlocking the value of the demand side. So there's that eco consultation around the smart EV charger standard, which we are very supportive of. Um, but I think there's also the second piece of the puzzle is having the digital platforms in place to actually manage that demand from EVs or energy using products. And so what we really need is for market participants to be investing in these types of solutions today. That does require a different regulatory approach to the siloed 1990s regulatory approach that, that we've got currently because the challenge is really one of accelerated technology integration and of accelerated market development. To make that happen, you need to be encouraging market participants to be engaging in these types of technologies rather than discouraging market participants from engaging in these technologies. It's really up to industry to be internalizing complexity and delivering something that's really simple and affordable to a consumer. Our system is gonna get so complex and if industry is doing its job, that should not be the consumer's problem. Yeah, I think I'd echo both what Ezra and Robin have said, um, and maybe take that a little bit further to maybe visualise what that looks like so you end up with a, so to speak, sexy word of decentralised energy, um, where either yourself or your community has, say, solar power, um, and then you take that, you take the excess energy, you're using that to charge your own EVs, you're using that to um, run all your power with, or for example, you've got a full charged EV that if you're not using the following day, you're using that battery to run you know, any of your household appliances on. So I think that one that obviously needs the, um, the technology and the digitization to make that really smart, um, but yeah, absolutely, that starts with your sort of community power. And absolutely, Ezra, I agree with you when you say um, there's sort of resilience in that as well. So certainly from a resilience or um, security um, point of view, that re that's obviously super helpful. Not, e not every country is created equal in terms of their accessibility to natural resources. Um, you're always going to have markets where you're exporting or importing energy. Um, and I think that as long as you have that, you have some sort of inequity in play and some sort of issue with security of supply. Yeah, it does sound a bit like hope thinking and I think, you know, we can't just sort of wait around for um, there to be abundant supply, but the good news is there's a lot that we can be doing right now. Um, for instance, focusing our attention towards solutions that can help optimise um, our system and getting the settings right to, to make that happen. It, it's good to strike a balance, but if you remove one or you get, one of, what, get rid of one of the trilemma, then the whole thing would fall over anyway. I think security, affordability and sustainability is just something that always needs to exist to just keep the whole um, industry kind of stable. Yeah, um, like pursuing the outcomes of the trilemma is obviously a really good idea, but we need to sort of adapt our mindset from seeing them as trade-offs. We need to be looking to go back to your initial point, Amelia, of having that macro systems level approach. We need to be looking at the creation of a reinforcing system which supports each one of these outcomes rather than having that kind of siloed trade-off mindset. I think the trilemmate index is a really interesting one because it's quite com like it's quite complicated to understand. I don't necessarily see why we need to rank ourselves against other countries. Um, what I do think is super useful though is the um, the delta or the imp the top improvers in the world energy trilemma. And I think there's a huge amount to learn from them. And yes, most of the improvers are um, countries that are high in poverty. Um, but I also think that that's where innovation is seeded. You, you're, when you're starting from kind of nothing and you're improving a lot, you're lo potentially looking at solving problems in a totally different way. And I think that's what we as a country could possibly learn from. So that's where I think the energy trilemma can be used like really well. Our big challenge to government at the moment, or to the politicians, is to, to come out 
and be with us and come to the homes of, of those that are um, suffering in, uh, because of the energy system and, and how it's laid out at the moment. Most of the meetings that we have at the moment when they come to our, our whare up in, in Kukiridoa will have at a customer's house and we'll tell them to leave the heaters off and we'll tell them just to keep the house as is. And when they talk about reports coming out next winter and stuff, they can feel the, the lack of warmth in the home that they're dealing with. So I think a lot of the things that, that they come to us with to consider are considered through a lens that hasn't had any access to any particular experience about what it's like to um, tell your children that they have to go to bed at five o'clock because mum and dad are ashamed that the power's going to go up. It's a very real issue, that affordability piece. And the more we talk about it in our silos, the, the harder it becomes. Um, yeah, well, I completely agree that um, I think it would serve some politicians and policymakers really well to get out of Wellington um, and to listen, actually, to stakeholders. Because at the end of the day, it's the end users of policies, it's voters, it's consumers. They should be the starting point of every decision that all of us are making in the sector, whether it's in government or out of government. I would agree, it's sort of get out of Wellington, listen, start with the people whose lives you're actually affecting. Um, and I guess as well, I think there's a real need to take a future lens rather than a past lens when it comes to thinking about the future. You know, there's, we've got a lot of sort of regulatory and market paradigms and thinking that have just been around for so long and they've really been challenged by digitalization and by de decarbonization. So I think there's a need to be a bit bold.